Well, last time we introduced the basic concepts, uh, number one of the Feast of the Lord, and then number two of the Feast of Tabernacles. And this session we want to focus on the Feast of Tabernacles itself, especially in light that it is the seventh feast. The position of these feasts carries significance, as we mentioned. And so the Feast of Tabernacles being the seventh, what, what would you suspect just from the number seven or just from the fact that it's the, the last that is true? Yes, that this, this is the finish of, of a perfect work. And that is what we have to look forward to in Christ. And for so many centuries, we figured the Christian life was just some sort of day-by-day, day endless, you just don't know what's happening, and you kind of hang in there, and the best hope you had was the hope of being saved. But rather, the scriptures show quite clearly that the process of redemption has a fulfillment. It has a, an end, it's, and it's a perfect end. It's not mystical, it's not hidden, but it is rich and it's specific. The need to understand the end of redemption is actually quite significant because in regards to human nature, because if you, uh, let's say you're a runner and you're going to run a race and you're all dug in at the starting line, you're on the blocks waiting for the starter to fire his pistol and uh, he says on your mark, get set and the pistol goes off and you go zooming down the uh, down your lane and you're running and you're running and the, uh, you're kind of in, in a bunch and, and you realize you don't know if this is a 100 meter dash or a 220 or a 440 or, or a marathon and so you say to someone next to you, you say, um, hey, how long is this race? Because it, it makes a difference on how you run. And his answer is, well, we don't know. It's, you just, I don't know, you just kind of keep going. And, well, actually, there isn't even an end. It just kind of keeps going. Well, immediately, you'll say, well, wait a minute, I better slow down here. This is, uh, I mean, I better prepare myself for the long haul. I mean, if, there's, if, if, I, if I don't know where I'm going, I'm, I'm not going to kill myself getting there for sure. And that is, in an anecdotal form, is what happens in the Christian life when you do not perceive that there is a completeness, a fullness of redemption, that there is a perfect work. When you see the perfect work, it becomes a mark. And if, if it's a 100-meter dash, you know there you just, boy, you just sprint as fast and hard as you can. If it's a marathon, you learn to pace yourself. You realize that you have to ad adjust your behavior in terms of where the goal is and what the goal is. And so correspondingly, it's, it's precisely the same in the Christian life. When the Christian sees the mark, and it's clear, and it is clearly spoken of in scriptures, then you can do your very best. You have something that you're shooting for. Be you are more willing to run the race with great diligence because you know when it's over, it's over. When it's finished, it's finished. When you've crossed the finish line, you've crossed the finish line. There's, it's madness to say you cross the finish line. You have to keep on going. Well, the Christian life is like a race, the Bible tells us. There's a definite beginning, and we're familiar with that. We've all heard the gun go off. <laughs> But maybe, depending on where you are in the Lord kind of thing, uh, maybe you've asked some co-runners, you know, say, how long is this thing? <laughs> and depending on their answer, you either started moderating your stride, or if they said this, you know, this is a 220. I mean, this is, this is whatever it is, once around the lap, and that's it. See, then you get down to business. You realize, you can see the goal. And you know where it is, and you know what's necessary to achieve it. And so you, you then give all that you are to achieving the goal. It's tangible and it's before you. And that is not an absurd dramatization of the scriptures at all. The scriptures tell us clearly there is a goal and urge us to press toward that goal and achieve the goal. 
There is a very real sense in the Christian life that there is a finish, an end. And I don't mean when you die. There comes a place in your Christian redemption when all is done. And that is good news. It's just like furniture. You know, you, you sand and you uh, mold and chisel, but the carpenter just doesn't keep on going forever. There comes a time when he stands back and he looks and he says, it's done. It needs no more. And it's the same in redemption. So let's look a little at that in the scriptures because it will help you to grasp the, uh, the Feast of Tabernacles as well as, I think, help you to understand uh, from a New Testament term, just that simple concept alone will help in... Uh, the, the, the proper motivating process in order for you to give all because it requires all. Yes. Uh, I was going to ask the question how realistic is the expectation that the Christian can realize that he's finally or he's reached the final mark or he's attained the goal in this life prior to uh, his life expiring? Is that a realistic expectation? And, uh, uh, well, let's ask a question. Why not? Well, the, the question is, is why is it, it, is it a realistic expectation that a Christian would know that he has finished, that he's crossed the finish line? And let me counter that by asking, what is it about the Christian life or the scriptures that suggests that it's not reasonable to expect that? Probably, if you just take the uh, the scriptures as the as the sole basis of your answer, there's probably nothing. There, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There, there you have it. If you take the scriptures, there's no reason why to doubt. And we'll, and we'll look at some. And there's some real humdingers in there. So, so we don't get our doubt from the scriptures. Whence cometh our doubts? Huh? Oh, I'm sure Satan's in there, you know, amplifying uh, everything he possibly can to rattle our confidence. I would think for ourselves, too. We would evaluate ourselves and think we could never measure Sure. We, we get discouraged. Yeah. Plus, we've never met anybody that said, I've been there. <laughs> Plus, you've never met anybody. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll introduce you to a few. Do you really know people that you feel have arrived? I feel like I know them. They may not know me. Well, I don't know. Paul, you're around? <laughs> you might know me. I don't know. Probably not. Someone asked over the, uh, over the break, if someone says, I've already experienced the Feast of Tabernacles, do you think that they have? And my first response is, uh, I, I think we ought to be generous, uh, because what I observe is that as you relate these things to the saints, it, it, it strikes a chord from within, and they realize it. They realize that the scripture actually says something that pertains directly to something that they've experienced. And so they, they, uh, they tend to do that. But uh, on the other hand, the very display of that itself is often counter to the Feast of Tabernacle. Experiencing the Feast of Tabernacles drives from you even the desire to put yourself on display and say, look at me. So that's one reason why the woods are full of them, but you just don't know. It's kind of like when the baby's born in the manger, unless you're watching, you just never know. Someone, I was speaking with someone who had been uh, a friend uh, from work who had just gone to uh, Israel. In fact, he was there shortly after uh, he left after I got back. And he said while he was walking through uh, the old city, he was walking from uh, Antonia's fortress to the garden tomb. There's a, uh, it's called the Via della Rosa, which is commemorated as the path that Christ walked. He said the thing that really struck him was that the, the hurly-burly life that you find in the old city, the you know, wrangling in the marketplace kind of thing, he saw firsthand how easy it would have been for Jesus to have been carrying his cross through that crown and most of the people not even notice. And so it is today. See, the gold of God is being formed in, in saints today. 
people don't notice. So you're not likely always to notice, but I think if you have your spiritual antenna up, you tend to see who your co-runners are. You tend to realize, you know, they're like me, and uh, and we're in this and uh, and experiencing the same kind of things. But if we don't have that kind of sight, then it leaves the impression that no one can make it, has made it, and uh, and therefore it's not uh, it cast doubt. <clears throat> and that doubt, that doubt must be inspected first in the light of the scriptures, and then. If there's no one in your nation that is going for it, why should that stop us or you? If you are the only one in that entire nation that says, Now, Lord, I, I want you to finish this task. I want, you, I want to know you. I've known you as the author of my faith. I want to know you as the finisher of my faith. I know you as the beginning I, you know, I am beginning and the ending, Jesus says. I am the first and the last. The, the, he's the author and the finisher of our faith. And all it takes is just one person to say, Lord, that's me. It's what I want. And Jesus isn't going to say, but, well, but there's nobody else experiencing this. <laughs> he won't do that. He'll say, now, there's, there's something in that nation there. In fact, he'll say, I'll, I'm going to save that nation and spare it for the sake of that one, because I want to nurture. I want to nurture them. They have faith. They are going to see their confidence steadfast through to the end. So there are a number of reasons why we have our confidence shaken, and one of the purposes of why we are exercised here is to develop a steadfast confidence, so that we know how to answer when someone brings a doubt to the dismay, and I'll, I'll give you a perfect example, is the ten spies that went in the land of promise. That's a classic example of the inability to believe that God can really pull this off. Of course he can do it. Yes, there are giants in the land. There are big ones at that. <laughs> but God is greater. And it takes a Joshua and a Caleb. See, God wants you to be a Joshua and a Caleb, not foolish, but there's just something that happens inside of you and you say, well, of course we can take this land. God has commanded it. It's through him. He, he provides the wisdom, the power, and the strength. And I'm willing. What lacks? Nothing. But it does take faith. Because Satan will discourage you. The world will discourage you. Your relatives will discourage you. The church will discourage you. So you have to shake that off. You know, suppose one runner says to the other runner, you're never going to make it. You know, boy, that, you say, well, you know, maybe, yeah, I'm starting to feel faint here. You know, there's something, something going wrong. And, oh, no, I'm not going to make it. You know, whereas we are made partakers of Christ. And that's an interesting phrase, to be a partaker of Christ. That's tabernacles. We are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast until the end. Just like you run a race. No difference. Uh, let's look at some of these. One uh, remarkable one is in uh, Philippians 3. This one is worthy of being committed to memory. And we'll see others. The purpose of this course is to show you New Testament for this concept of tabernacles. Uh, we have to get into the Old Testament first because I want to sh show you what what specifically, when we talk about this seventh feast, what specifically uh, occurred, because uh, we want to borrow on the types. But Philippians chapter 3, here, here is a man who is pressing. You can begin at verse 8. He, he's just gone through his pedigree. Uh, it's remarkable. He's circumcised the eighth day, just like you're supposed to. He was the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin. He was a Hebrew of the Hebrews. Touching the law, he was a Pharisee. He, concerning zeal, he persecuted the church. Touching righteousness of the law, he was blameless. But all those things that were gained to me, I counted but loss for Christ. Verse 8, yea, doubtless I count all things but loss. See, this, this attitude is one who, of you know, the runner that, sh that disciplines himself. A runner will not drink a chocolate milkshake every day. They will shun it. 
he says, fine, but I, I count it as lost. Says, yeah, it'd be great, because I enjoy them. But I count it as gone. And you just count the cost to running the race with Christ. For the excellency of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, my Lord. Which is, by the way, is another description of tabernacles. You come to know the Lord, and really. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, refuse, that I may win Christ. Now where does that fit in our doctrine that Jesus needs to be won? Think about that. Well, he does need to be one. He is the goal. He's the finish line. He is the way. And he must be one. And you can be disqualified along the way. He needs to be one. And Paul says, I'm forgetting all of my pedigree because I want to win him. I want to know him and I want to win him. This is an apostle speaking. And be found in him. And that's another description of tabernacles. We'll see this. <clears throat> we're, we're just kind of introducing this here. Not having mine own righteousness, which is that of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And we describe that in the Day of Atonement. That I may know him. That's the second reference to that. Doesn't sound like Paul knows the Lord. How can that be? It's because... There's knowing the Lord, and then there's knowing the Lord. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. And that's another mark, that's another goal, that's another... It's a manifestation. You are shown to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead, just as Jesus was demonstrated to be the Son of God by the resurrection from the dead. No resurrection, no Son of God. So Paul is doing this so that by any means he might attain. The resurrection needs to be attained, by the way. It's not the subject of this course, but that's part of the pressing toward the mark that we're relating here. We say, well, Paul is just talking, he's being humble. And he's, he's an apostle, and so he's well accomplished, and probably has achieved all these things. But, you know, in order to help encourage the Philippians church, he's reasoning as among them. And actually, Paul does that. He says, I reason, I, I'm reasoning like a man does. So we've got plenty of scripture to back up such rationale. What's the problem with that? What's the problem with what I just characterized of why Paul is saying, you know, that I may win him, I may know him, if by any means I might attain in the resurrection of the dead? What's, what's wrong with saying that, uh, you know, he, he really did already experience it? Because he's an apostle, I mean, after all, a mighty man of God. But he's rather doing it uh, in order to you know, kind of make it a little easy on the saints. He doesn't want to put it on display, obviously, and kind of being one of the boys and, Encouraging the saints on. Why doesn't that wash? Because the very verse following nails it. Do you have an idea? Is that what you're going to say? No, I was going to just say that it was reality for him. He really did have to. Yes, he's, he's talking from the heart. This, is, this isn't uh, let's be nice to people and help them understand kind of thing. This isn't PR, public relations. This is the cry of an apostle. And he nails it with the next verse. Not as though I had already attained. He says, now look, you know, I'm not just talking nonsense here. I haven't made it. Either we're already perfect. And you say, well, if you're an apostle and you haven't already made it, why don't you just quit? Well, it's the other way around. It's like, I haven't made it. I can see it. And I'm heading toward it, you know. <laughs> and there's no reason to stop halfway through a race. I mean, why don't you quit after the race is over? And we'll cross that line, and then, you know, then, then you can take it easy. But I follow after that if I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And that's what you do 
That's, that's part of redemption, is the process of apprehending the very thing for which God has called you. And he says again, you say, well, surely he has apprehended. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. And he says, this, he says I don't count that I've apprehended, but you want to know what I do think. This is how I act. This is what I do. I, f I forget those things which are behind doesn't matter if no one's ever done this before. I put those things behind, reaching forth unto those things which are before. That's what the runner has to do. I press toward the mark, toward the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Is, is this in terms of a race or not? Do you ever think of Jesus as a prize? There is. There's a mark. And there's a high calling that you have. And it's the end of the goal. It's the goal itself. The high calling is the goal itself. It's a mark. And you have to press for it. Because there are a lot of things that are going to press you away from it. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us, therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. What kind of minded is that? Forgetting those things which are behind? Reaching forth into those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And if in anything you be otherwise minded, God will point it out to you. That upsets God when you start thinking, well, I don't really think I can make it. God will get on that and he'll point it out. He'll say, my son, my daughter, what are you thinking? Come on now. Get on the stick here. If you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. So he cares whether you care. And when he sees us not care, then comes the pressure. He'll reveal it to you. Isn't that interesting? Nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, and let us mind the same thing. <clears throat> Brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as you have for us an example. What does that say? It suggests, doesn't it, that there are others running the race with you? Mark who they are. Follow them. And when you see how high they leap for the next hurdle, figure, yep, it's going to be the same for me. So actually, this race is more like a, I don't know what you call a kind of race, where everybody kind of runs together. And, of course, only the guy in front wins, but, but it's, it's really just a crowd running. But if you watch the people who are ahead of you, if there are any problems, they experience the problem first and register a signal that then shows you, here's a problem here. There's a gully you've got to leap over, or a puddle of water to avoid. So you mark them. Mark them who run with you and follow them, they will lead you. Walk also as you have us for an example. Praise the Lord. So that's one example. Let's look at Hebrews 4.1. Let us therefore fear, this is a commandment, let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should, see, should seem to come short of it. That or watch it. You don't want to come short. And what is it that, that he is exhorting us directly not to come short in? Entering into his rest. And entering into the rest of God is another characteristic. It's another description of the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles itself is not only the process, but it is itself the entering in to the rest of God. We'll try to be clear throughout the course what these singular concepts are that are present in the Feast of Tabernacles because there are many, easily 10, 15, 20 massive concepts that relate to the Feast of Tabernacles. We've already seen the idea of winning Christ, attaining the resurrection from the dead, entering into the rest of God, the prize. 
Uh, verse 6, seeing therefore it remains that some must enter therein. For, and they to whom it was first preached enter not in because of unbelief. Uh, and then verse uh, 9, there remains therefore a rest to the people of God. In other words, the complaint here, and we'll, we'll go into this a little more thoroughly, Lord willing, during the uh, other portions of the course. The main complaint here is using this massive type of the, of the wilderness wanderings. They did not enter into the rest of God because of their unbelief. You, church, are doing the same thing. You're falling behind, and you're not going to enter into rest just like they didn't. Now, this is not a call, obviously, to the land of promise. I think the Crusaders might have thought so. But obviously, we are not called. That is not the rest of God. The rest of God is distinctly described elsewhere in the uh, scriptures. And it's interesting, in reading Jewish writings, uh, the rabbis characterize Shabbat, the seventh day, in these terms of entering into the rest of God. Tabernacles. In fact, they cite the tabernacle in, uh, in the wilderness as an example, as a type. Last time we spoke of uh, the richness of understanding that, uh, that our brethren, our Jewish brethren have. Verse 11, <clears throat> let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. That's pretty clear, isn't it? So when people want to discourage us by saying, well, no one else has done it before, what you can say is, well, millions came out by Moses, but only two went into the land. Which are you? Are you going to fall in the wilderness through unbelief, or are you a Joshua or a Caleb? And then you say, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. That's the kind of attitude it takes. Let's look at a couple more. Uh, Hebrews 6, first couple verses here. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Now that is pretty plain, isn't it? What would you say then, if this is tabernacles, what's, what's another way of characterizing tabernacles? Perfection. And that shouldn't startle us. We've already seen in the, in the sixth day of the Lord that over... Coming Satan and overcoming sin and, and self-will is, uh, is accomplished through the body and blood of Jesus Christ. But there's more to perfection than that, by the way. Being free from sin, you're not perfect yet, unfortunately. Are, are we talking total perfection or are we talking what Christ will accept? Or, I, mean, I mean, I think that gets back to Bill's question. We, I don't think we can even fathom 100% in terms of perfection. Why not? What What is it that troubles us? <laughs> it's a dandy of a question. It really is, and I'm not. I'm not poking fun at you. Because, I mean, that's that. It's that is the issue. See? First off, what does the scripture say? Does it say total perfection, whatever that is? Does it say um, let us go on to whatever whatever it is that that Jesus can accept? Yes, yeah, so when you start studying perfection from the Bible, you start realizing that there's a standard. Be you perfect as I am perfect. And so if that's what we mean by being totally perfect, but we don't need the word totally there. Perfection is perfection. Yes, if there's a flaw, then it's not perfect. And so the question then is, well, is there a standard by which Jesus will accept something less Will he accept some flaws? And the answer there is no. Not in tabernacles. Be you perfect as I am perfect. See, in Romans 8, what are we predestined to? For whom he foreknew, he also did predestinate to become formed to the image of his Son. And there's a good term to look up in a concordance, perfection. Because the Bible unequivocally shows us that God expects us to be done with this matter of all the harm that Satan has done. He really does expect us to be delivered. 
and redeemed completely. See, the Feast of Tabernacles is when you are completely redeemed. All that needs to be done is done. You are then brought to completion and fullness such that when you are compared with Christ, there is nothing in him that is not in you. And there is nothing in you that is not in him. See, we don't want just a part of him where there's a, such that there remains a part of him that does not enter into us. Nor do we want a part of us that never enters into him. We want all that we are to be in Christ and all that is in Christ to be in us. That's another description of tabernacles. So that as he is, so are we in this world, 1 John. In this world, as he is, so are we. And See, we've been tricked. Because there are giants in the land. And they are real giants. They're vicious and cruel and brutal, cunning with age and deception. But it's a question of Joshua and Caleb again. Yes. Say that part of not believing that he can make us perfect would prevent us from actually entering into it. Because right. That, not believing that he can do this and will and shall and can and must and everything else is the very component that prevents us from, from entering into it. It's unbelief. Before, yes. It it's unbelief. So it takes, uh, it takes a while. First off, it kind of, uh, what I'm trying to do is to drive a wedge in your, in your conceptual thinking so that you realize we're not equivocating here. We're not, I don't want to leave the impression that I am willing to alter what we are saying because the Bible doesn't. And this is a very high calling. It's, it's his highest. It's his greatest redemption is not a small ho-hum thing it's precious it's the treasure hidden in the field and you can go all day long walking by that field and uh, and snicker at the people who are looking for it praise the Lord so what tends to happen though John and your, your question is right on is that as soon as we hear the word perfect, something goes off in our mind as to what that is. It's kind of like you become a robot or we've portrayed some sort. For example, someone who is perfect would never become angry. Right? No. Jesus got angry. And he got violent. See, so our measure of perfection is probably flawed. Our understanding of what perfection is is probably flawed. And so I don't want to, I don't want to say that to introduce the possibility that therefore we can have flaws in our perfection. But sometimes through simple misconceptions, we don't realize what it is that the Lord has called us to. So by, if we're not careful, we can miss it because we assign something to the goal in Jesus that should not be assigned, or we try to make the goal something less than it really is. Either way, we don't see that finish line clearly, and consequently, we don't press for it. It's just not worth it. Who wants to work that hard? Yes, Bill? It seems that some of the problem that seems to smack in the face is when you think of the, the term perfection and somehow feel like there has to be some trans, immediate transformation in order to be acceptable rather than looking at it as something we should be striving for on a daily basis like the mark is something we should be striving for and to the extent that we're doing following the commandments of God on a daily basis and, and walking according, according to the light that we have then, then we could assume that we have some measure or some hope of attaining perfection in, in that regard on a daily basis. Yes, I think that's, uh, that's a good uh, characterization. Jesus does not expect these things done overnight. It's like line upon line, if that's from um, 
Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. We won't turn there, but it's line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, uh, there a little. What the Lord does, he does by increments. In fact, he said, using the land of promise as the allegory, he said, I am not going to drive the enemy out from you all at once. He says, if I do that, then the beast of the field is going to rise up and you're going, to, you're going to have a worse problem. I'm going to drive them out little by little, city by city. And that's all it takes is just one city at a time. Also, remember, he said, when I take you to the land of promise, I'm not going to take you by the direct route. He could have taken them right up a trade route, up by the Mediterranean Sea and right, in, right into Israel. He took them south. He took them to Sinai. He said, lest they see war and faint along the way. So Jesus knows what we can take. And he doesn't lay a trip on us and, and expect graduate school behavior when we're still in third grade. He wants third grade behavior. And when he gets second grade behavior, he tells us about it. See, redemption's a process. And we have a master teacher. We have a redeemer who knows what he's doing, who guides leads, directs on a daily basis. For example, in overcoming sin. If we through the Spirit put to death the deeds of the body, we shall live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, the Spirit of God will lead you to, in conquest of the land of promise. He'll say, Jericho is the next city, and here's how you defeat Jericho. We don't have to invent that. In fact, if you try to do it on your own, it'll fail. But God will give clear instructions. And the only time Joshua blew it was when those Gideonite, uh, Gibeonites came and lied to him. Remember, they put on old clothes and brought in moldy bread? And he didn't go to the Lord. If he had gone to the Lord, the Lord would have said, Joshua, these guys are from right around the corner. They're deceiving you. But he said, well, you know, sure, we'll, uh, we'll acquiesce here. He just did not bother to pray. So, all of these things are hindrances to experiencing the fullness of redemption. And there are many more, too, and, and we intend to cover some of these as the course proceeds. Let's look, uh, see, Hebrews 6, the first verse. Therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. If, if you have that understood and established, you don't go back and dig it up and start all over again. Once that foundation is down, the, the process of redemption is when you, when you get something down, you go on from it. It becomes the, the, a stepping stone to the next lesson in the Lord. So you don't lay down again the, the foundation of repentance from dead works or faith toward God or the doctrine of baptisms, plural, or the laying on of hands and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And one way to see... I think how you're doing in some of these concepts is can you explain to someone repentance from dead works? Can you explain to someone faith in God? Can you explain the doctrine of baptisms, plural? There's more than one baptism. What baptisms are there? Fire, water, Holy Spirit. Uh, baptism of John, there's one more still. Suffering. Suffering. Are you willing to be baptized with the baptism that I am, said Jesus, meaning the cross? Laying on of hands? What's the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead? What's the doctrine of eternal judgment? Well, the Bible exhorts us, look, once you get those down, move on. Don't, don't go back and re- uh, dig them up and, and try to solve the same problem all over again. Once, once you understand faith, once you understand the resurrection, once you understand eternal judgment, you continue on. And this we do if God permits. It's always by God. It's always by His grace. It's always by His enabling that, uh, that we go on. So it's important. As it, as it goes on, and it shows, uh, it shows why it's important. It, we lay these things aside and, uh, and press on. Let's find another one. John 4:34. It's interesting that this is, this is in John. 
the Gospel of John is the best description of the Feast of Tabernacles. We'll see this. But here's a John 4, 34. Jesus said unto them, My meat, and in the King James, you can always usually replace the word food for the word meat. It does not mean what we think of, you know, animal muscle. My food, the thing that the thing that gives me life, the thing that gives me nourishment and strength and the the vitality that it's needed to press on, the, the thing that it was actually his motivating factor is to do the will of him that sent him and to finish his work. That's important. Jesus did not have in front of him this endless, oh, another day, you know, what, what's going to happen now? But see, the Father had assigned him a limited amount of work. There was just only so much the Father expected, wanted, and designed to be done. And it's the same, it's the same for us. You know, the Christian life is just not this endless day after day, oh no, one more day, and you know, can I possibly figure out what, what it is God is calling me to? No, you, God has, we used to say God has a plan for your life, and he does. And it's described, where is it, in Ephesians? Ephesians 2, around 10, uh, that God has established works. He has ordained works for you to walk in. There is a path that God has placed before you. It's a calling. You have a specific, defined, limited, limited set of things that God wants achieved in you and by you. And when the job is done, it's done. It's like repairing the car when it's when it's fixed it's fixed there's not there isn't the Christian life is not this endless process of fixing there are certain things that are out of line and it's because we were born in sin and shape and iniquity when those have been corrected and the proper transformations have been made it's finished there, there is a finish line it's real and Jesus' goal and, his, and the source of his vitality was that, number one, God had something for him to do, and secondly, that he was also called to finish it. Did Jesus ever finish? Or was he a day late and a dollar short? Oh, Lord, if you just needed one more day, I was that close. I mean, really, just real close. No. No. What does Jesus say on the cross? It is finished. You say, well, that's Jesus. That doesn't apply to the saints. Yes, it does apply to the saints. Well, where's that in the Bible? Where is that in the Bible? The Apostle Paul. Well, the Apostle Paul was striving for it, according to Philippians 3. 2 Timothy. Second Timothy. And what do we know about 2 Timothy? That's the last book he ever wrote. Yeah, he was martyred uh, shortly after uh, writing 2 Timothy. So where is that? That's 2 Timothy 4, 7. In fact, if you go back a little, one problem evidently with Timothy, because this is present both in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, although T Timothy was the first bishop of the church in, uh, in Ephesus, it says in the, in the notes, uh, which is part of the text, I believe. He evidently did not have this desire to be performing God's will, to be doing what God wanted him to do. It was timid Timothy. And so Paul, both in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, says, Timothy, let's get on with this. You're, you're, you know, lay hold of eternal life. Now, there's a good expression for an apostle to tell the first bishop in a city, number one elder, Lay hold of eternal life. See, it makes no sense to us, does it? Well, it does in terms of the Feast of Tabernacles. Because eternal life is something that gets grasped. It doesn't. It's not just something that kind of happens. It is not granted. Eternal life is not produced in its fullness when we first come to the Lord. We have a measure of life. And the purpose of the Christian life is for that life to grow. See, I have come that they might have life and that abundantly. 
life comes in quantities. You can, you can get a case. You can get 24 containers of life. Or just one. Life grows. Life increases. It has to be laid hold of. So, verse 5, he says, But watch thou in all things, endure inflictions, do the work of an evangelist, and make full proof of your ministry. <clears throat> kind of get on the stick here. And you'll uh, read First and Second Timothy together in one sitting, and you'll, uh, you'll see this edge. And, of course, it applies to us, too. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. He didn't say that he never got knocked down. He just fought a good one. How about you? You, you in there? You're fighting a good fight? That doesn't mean you never get hit in the chin. But you ought to be fighting a good fight. You shouldn't be a coward. You shouldn't whimper every time you get knocked down to the mat. You say, rather, Lord, you are my deliverer. You are my strength and my song. I fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And I like that, too, because evidently one of the problems in redemption is hanging on to this faith as a, as a foundation. Remember we read in Hebrews 6, um, faith toward God. Evidently, faith can slip through your fingers somehow, huh? Something has to be kept. Paul said, I kept it. I finished my course. What's the result of this? Henceforth, there is laid up for me. Wow! Can you imagine this? this now, this is a Christian talking. He says, I've made it, boys. I, I crossed over the line. I'm, I'm done the course. It's over. And I made it. The idea that you can never know whether you make it, I, I don't know where that comes from. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. Well, fine. You, that's Jesus and that's Paul. But how can you possibly extend it to anyone else? I mean, let's face it, that's pretty disappointing that these two examples are probably the most two outstanding examples in the New Testament. You don't find Philip talking this way, or Andrew, or James, or Peter, or John. How do you respond? I'm suggesting it's for us all. very next verse he says look I'm not the only one not to me only you say well you've got to be an apostle that's what you've got to be and I'm not an apostle I've never called to be an apostle don't even know how to spell it is that what he said what did he say what's he saying what, what kind of those now isn't that remarkable isn't that a remarkable criteria Wow! You mean that's all? Just love is appearing? Hey, this is sound, getting, getting to sound a little easy. I can do that. Even so, Jesus, come. Lord, wow! <laughs> you know? And there you are, along with Jesus and James and John and Peter and Paul, receiving a crown of life. And you'll see Paul. And he'll say, I told you. I told you it wasn't me only, but anyone who loved his appearing. Didn't I say that? And look at them all come. Look at them come. Each one with a crown. Loves his appearing. It, I find that remarkable. That's remarkable, the, the association between receiving the crown of life and the loving of his appearing. You'd think it'd be something... You know, really wild, something really, I mean, something, the kind of thing that one saint in about 20,000 is able to do. You know, some heroic, not only me. So that puts down the arguments. So you say to the person who's reasoning with me, with you, do you love his appearing? Oh, gee, maybe I don't. Or if you're someone of faith, you say, well, yeah, I think I do. Yeah, I want him to come. My, 
My heart pants for the Lord. I love him. I don't want to be separated from him. I don't want this to go on like this. I, I want him to become. You know, I don't, I'm not happy with the way things are. I want him here <laughs> fast. Say you, or you're a servant that says, my Lord delays his coming and begins to beat the, uh, the fellow servants. He's going to get into trouble when the Lord comes. But the one that loves his appearing, what's his reward? The crown of life. And what's the crown of life assigned to? What, on what basis? Why does someone receive a crown of life? By what basis? What is the, what are the, uh, yes, he fought, he fought a good fight and he finished the course. See, and we know that because he says in front, henceforth, you know, in other words, this is, this is where it's going. This is the, this is the purpose that is serving. Receive a crown of life. And not only me, see, all of a sudden argumentation begins to, begins to disappear. It's not as hard, maybe, as the devil would like us to feel. All it is is Goliath. It's just that rotten, better watch my language, what, what can you politely call someone? <coughs> Turkey. This guy, that's what David's response is. This uncircumcised nothing has everybody scared. Come on, you guys. He's, he's cursing the people of Israel. God is with us. Give me these stones and I'm going to go out and I'm going to do it. One man, one David, a boy at that. The only reason why he was there, he had brought, he had brought lunch for his elder brothers who were in the army. And that's a perfect picture of the, of the, of the church today. Oh, but Goliath says we can't. <gasps> well, get to know David a little bit. See, well, that that Goliath, he, that that nobody, he's nothing. He's a loser. He's gone. He's, his days are numbered. It's just show. I don't care if he is. Uh, my son read in the in the Guinness World uh, Book of Records. Uh, Goliath is in there, but Guinness says that you know, for being the tallest uh, man. Guinness says that, that Goliath's height, as recorded, is grossly exaggerated. <laughs> well, this man, what was he, nine cubits or seven cubits? Or, he, he was way up there. He was like nine feet tall. He was big. And it took a, a man just to carry a spear. Yeah, it's as uh, tall as this ceiling here, just about. So, what kind of a heart do you have? for this. Are you David? Or are you like the rest of Israel? These are the days for Davids. God is calling Davids. And you can see what you have to decide. I'm trying to make the issue as plain as I can at the same time and show you this, look, this is what the scriptures say. I'm inviting a David response. I'm praying that there's enough David in your heart that you'll say, oh, we can do it, can't we? We really can. We can please the Lord. We can walk holy and unblameable. We can serve him and please him and finish our life in him and receive it all. Top grade, top of the line. It's only the giants and the murmuring saints that have any chance of convincing us otherwise. So when someone says to you and says, well, does this really, you know, is this really possible? This is what you do. You say, well, I don't know. Let's look at the scripture and, 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 and see what you think. Well, what do you think? You don't have to answer. What do you really think? Are we pulling a long bow here? Or is this what it says? Well, this is the subject of this course. What are the processes? Having understood Pentecost, trumpets, the Day of Atonement, what is now the final stages? 
What is it that God requires? What will he do? And how do you recognize it so that you become a finished product and not three-sevenths complete? But to be complete in him. Isn't that the prayer of the apostles? To be complete in him. You can be complete in him. It's ordained. It's predetermined. It's predestinated. For whom he did foreknow, that's pretty strong. He did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Predestinate. It's already written. God has a place for you already reserved. It's your place. It's, it's already there. Your place is there. Sound like he's pretty confident. God doesn't waste time or people or anything. That's his expectation. And he has prepared a place for you. And we'll go into John 14 where Jesus describes that because Jesus is talking about tabernacles specifically by name, by type and by precept. We'll see this in John 14. Well, we have time maybe for one more. Let's look at Hebrews uh, 2.12. I'm sorry, 12.2. Uh, Hebrews 12.2. Looking unto Jesus. This is Hebrews 12, chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. We've known him as the author of our faith. We haven't yet known him as the finisher of our faith. Look at the verse before. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great cloud of witnesses, and you look back one chapter, this is the chapter of faith, we're talking about Noah and Abraham and Jephthah and Rahab. And Let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily besets us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, comma, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Am I pulling a long bow when I say the Christian life is like a race and that Jesus himself is the goal? He is the finish line? He need, you need to look unto Jesus, not only as author of your faith, but finisher of your faith too. He wants the case closed. He wants the stain brought in by Adam and Satan eradicated. And when it's eradicated, it's eradicated. When it's gone, it's gone. When you have finished what you God has sent you to do, you're finished. Praise the Lord. There is a finish line. And the Feast of Tabernacles is that end. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank you that you so plainly in the scriptures encourage us to walking a path that is filled with such majesty and glory. We pray, Lord, that we might be able to shake ourselves from these voices that tell us it can't be done, it can't be done, it can be done, Lord, because you have promised it, Lord. It, it's your honor that's being impeached here, Lord. And we just pray that you would help our hearts, Lord, to turn...